here I have a list representation of the same kind of step, set of steps. So let's get started. All right, first thing we want to make sure our local dev environment is set up. So here I have a clean code ML exercise repo that you can check out and follow along. In this demo, I'm going to use Docker, but in my other videos, I show you how to um, use either Conda or even plain Python. So uh, choose whatever works for you, but in this video, I will use Docker. So I'm going to follow the steps and get my machine set up for starting to code. So here I'm inside my Docker environment. Can run unit tests. I will run it in watch mode. Now there are no tests, but that's fine. And next thing I will start my Jupyter server. To do that, To do that, I need to get inside this same Docker container and we'll start our Jupyter server. And this is going to be our starting point where we start to refactor. The, this is the Titanic data set and it's a classification problem. So for each row, we have a passenger and its properties. For example, this is Mr. Owen his age, um, his fare, um, his gender, and finally the target variable is whether he survived or not. And this is a big chunk of data transformations. Um, and finally, once we prepare the data, we train a model and to predict whether you know, a passenger would survive or not. That's the problem at hand. And now our machine is set up, so let's mark this as done. The next thing we want to do is to make sure uh, the robot, notebook works. <clears throat> and everything works, so we are good to start. And next thing we'll do is to make a copy of this notebook. That's done. And the next thing we'll do is to remove print statements, and this will enable us to uh, be better at listing code smells. I've already, I've already done this for this video, so I just want to show you what it is without print statements and what it looks like with print statements. So without print statements, um, of course, this is not the best code base, but at least you can see what is the data transformation and what is the actual logic uh, that's going on uh, as compared to something like this <clears throat> where there's a lot of noise amidst um, the actual data transformations. So once we've removed the print statements, it's, e it's easier for us to start um, listing the code smells. So let's mark that as done. The next thing we'll do is to list code smells. And for this video, I've already listed the code smells to save us some time. And I'll just walk you a few, through a few of them, right? So here the code smell is that um, the implementation logic is exposed. If I want to understand this code, I have to, I'm forced to read everything and understand the how in order to know uh, the what. So um, in my other video on code smells, I talk uh, in more detail about this. So if you're interested, please watch the video and you'll see why this is a problem in uh, data science code. Other code smells are like duplicate responsibility. So DF drop is uh, happen, happening many places. So there's no reason why it should be at so many other places. I think there should be a single place where unnecessary columns are removed. So we would probably put that all together. Another code smell is dead code. This column is defined, but it's never used. So we create it, instantiate it, and immediately drop it without uh, being used anywhere else. 
later on in the, v in the demo, I realized that these magic numbers are actually the output of this. So somebody had printed it and you know, used the magic numbers here. So that's not ideal, um, and we'll see how we can improve this. Again, more exposed internals. Uh, duplicate responsibility. You see these two lines doing kind of exactly the same thing um, in a very long-winded and uh, verbose way. So probably we can extract this complexity into a function. And again, you see the pattern here repeating itself. And lastly, uh, this is the easiest case in my opinion. We see explicit duplication in all these cells. We instantiate a, a model, we train it, we do some predictions and we score it, right? So we see the same thing happening here. Fit, predict, score, fit, predict, score. So this is a kind of clear candidate for refactoring into a function. So we've done that and Next thing we'll do is to convert this to a Python file, and I'll show you why um, this would be helpful for us. So I'll leave this Jupyter server running, and and so this is the command to convert it to a script, a Python script. And now we have a Python file that is exactly the same as our notebook. And, and now we see, um, I, um, the idea has just reminded me I haven't selected my Python interpreter, so let me do that right now. This will help our IDE become smarter about our Python environment and help us have better suggestions. Okay, so coming back to converting the notebook, we're going to remove the noise from uh, Jupyter Notebook. All of these lines can go. So you see, it's a little bit hard to read because there's so many comments. So let's remove all of those things that we don't need. The main goal here is to have a Python script that you can work with. Something that you can read, that you can easily move things around, and also something that you're comfortable with. Um, it might take a bit of time to get used to not seeing Python code or data science code in these cells and with this nice UI. Um, but in the long run, it's much easier to um, edit code in an IDE, and I hope to demonstrate that to you through this video. For me, personally, I'm using white space as a kind of marker as a cell, so I know that, okay, this is probably one cell, this is probably another cell, this is another cell, this is another cell. And I hope that in this video, I can show you why I prefer to work in an IDE, uh, the utilities or the tools that it gives me uh, makes me more productive as a developer or as a data scientist as compared to uh, working with a Jupyter Notebook. So yeah, stay tuned for the rest of this video to find out um, the, the pros and cons of each one of them. So we've made some changes to the code. So let's just run this Python file and make sure everything still works. We'll say python uh, notebooks titanic.py okay in, indeed there's some jupyter specific thing that does, doesn't work in a python script so let's remove that there's a problem in line 10 let's go there so this get python we are not in the ipython environment anymore we don't need this Okay, so everything works. Exit code is zero, so you know the script was successful. So that's done. And we've made a couple of changes, so I want to make a commit now so that you know we don't have too much work in progress. So git status. Let's review what has changed. So, so you can either use git at p to kind of go through them one by one. Um, or if you are using VS Code, you can simply um, click this button and you can view the changes side by side immediately. 
So okay, we checked all these tasks as done. I will add, git add this. We created the copy of the original, so we will add this. Um, this is the original notebook. It looks like a bunch of cell numbers have changed. Um, that's fine for me. So, yeah. And this is another benefit of not using Jupyter notebooks. So, there's a lot of noise in this notebook, even though there's not zero lines of code has been changed. So once we move away from notebooks, you will start ha stop having noise like this. And we have a new Python file, Python script that is the same as our Jupyter notebook. Then we add that. All right, so let's commit this. Okay, converted Jupyter notebook to Python script and completed prep tasks for refactoring. Uh, these are the tasks we finished. Let's go. The next important step is to determine the boundary of our refactoring. So Martin Fowler calls this the seams of refactoring. So your code might not always be refactorable. It might be one big blob of code. So we have to identify where exactly we can um, say, okay, this is the core of what we want to refactor. And once we've identified this seam or this boundary, this allows us to add an automated test to make sure that when we refactor, we don't break anything within this boundary. So let me show you what I mean by that. For me, in this code base, the boundary would start uh, here when the with the loading of data. And second, we would include the transformation, all of the data pre-processing. And finally, it would include the model training. That is the job of this uh, code. Let's set, let's set this as our boundary and we'll add an automated test for this. And let's make this boundary explicit by defining a function. And everything moves into this function. I've changed a little bit of code. So in absence of any unit test, I will have to manually test that everything still works. So we have some problem now. The something outside the boundary is trying to access something inside the boundary. So to me, this uh, models part, it's not within the boundary because it's just like a visual feedback that we were trying to get without unit tests. Um, it was like this in the notebook. To know that this notebook works, we would have this uh, data frame with some numbers, right? So the numbers is what we care about to make sure that this whole thing works. So I will add this to the boundary of this function. Return all our A's. All of these things, we will need to return it from within this boundary. And now we're gonna write a unit test to replace this visual inspection to do this, we will need to write an automated test. And first of all, let's move this um, code, this source code now. So I will move it from notebooks into source code. And I will rename the, un the um, dashes to underscores so that we can import this function in a unit test. And that's what I will do right now. Okay, a new test. Um, this will be a functional test. So this is the test for that boundary, the automated test for that boundary. We, our function prepare data and train model should return the accuracy scores. And if this test passed, we would know that we haven't broken anything um, inside here, at least in broad strokes. Let's invoke our function. I just want to pause here and show that um, this is why I prefer an ID. It's, um, it's figured out where our source code is, where our functions are, and made, start, started to make uh, helpful suggestions. And we wouldn't get this in a Jupyter notebook. All right. So we know that um, once we get this, we will get a series, uh, six scores, a tuple of scores.
So for each of these score, we just assert that it is um, greater than 0 0.5. And my main purpose of having this test is not so much the accuracy of the model, just but just to make sure that there is a harness around what I'm changing so that when this function is invoked, all of this code is run, it doesn't blow up. And if it should blow up, the test would immediately fail and we have an automated way of telling me that, hey, I've done something wrong, I've broken something, stop now and look carefully. To see this in action, let's run our tests. For example, if through the refactoring, I accidentally killed a line of code and you know forgot to fill NA, this test will now give us immediate feedback to say that, hey, you've, we've done something uh, wrong, so please pause and step back. Uh, we might not have had this immediate feedback if we were we didn't have this automated test. So that's one good thing. The downside though is that it's a black box test and it's at a very broad strokes. It doesn't care if the model degrades. Um, for that, we will have more fine grain uh, model tests for each of them. And in my other video on metrics tests, I talk in greater detail on how you can write a test like this. But for this refactoring, this is enough for us to um, add a test to where our refactoring boundary is, where the seams are, and ensure that we don't um, break things along our refactoring. There's now just one more thing I want to improve about this test, and that is the noisy output of the test runner. Let's read the warnings and fix them one by one. Future warning, sorting because non-concatenational axis is not allowed. Except future behavior say sort is false. All right, go with that. Okay, there's one more warning from a cyclone model, SVM. The default value of gamma will be changed from auto to scale. Um, to avoid this warning, set gamma to auto or scale explicitly. Okay, at this moment, I don't really care about either, so I will just set it to one or the other. Here, gamma, I would say auto. So let's make a commit and start refactoring. 